In stories like Rappuccini's Daughter and Dr. Heidegger's Experiment, Nathaniel Hawthorne uses six key elements of imagery, generic background, ideology, character, narrative structure, and symbolic structure that together form the Eden complex, a phenomenological complex akin to the Prometheus complex that Gaston Bachelard explicates for fire, simultaneously embodying knowledge and life, and also overwhelming passion and destruction. In many ways, the Eden complex provides the framework for all modern science fiction. Written within that framework, the artist of the beautiful suggests the need to renounce egotism in our pursuit of science to avoid tragedy. Edgar Allan Poe's science fictions, like Descent into the Maelstrom, The Pit and the Pendulum, and the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar, show the adaptability of the Eden complex and the ultimate powerlessness of the isolated ego. Indeed, America's most famous early writers often produced science fiction. Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. wrote a series of so-called medical novels in the most famous Elsie Venner. The main character is the result of a birth in which her mother was bitten by a snake while she was in utero. This character hisses and insinuates herself as she walks down the streets. But in fact, the point of the science fiction here is to give a naturalistic context within which to explore the meaning of original sin. In A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, Mark Twain uses unexplained time travel to explore quite comically the uses of science. It's extraordinary that science doesn't just give us answers. If you don't have the infrastructure available, there's no way you can bring your scientific knowledge to bear. Science is not just the work of one wonderful, clever um, Yankee tinker like Hank Morgan. It is, in fact, something that represents an entire culture. But the great American pioneers of science fiction were Poe and Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne is a key figure in American literature. His work, The Scarlet Letter, is perhaps one of the two most important novels of the 19th century, the other being Moby Dick. At the end of The Scarlet Letter, Dimsdale, the adulterer of the woman who's made to wear The Scarlet Letter, bears his chest on a, on a scaffold in front of the townspeople. Some see nothing there. Others magically see the scarlet A for adulterer on his chest. And others, believing that the adultery has finally been accepted by heaven, see it reflected in the clouds and the sky. Is this fantasy? Is this projection? Is this love conquering all? In the House of Seven Gables, we have the conflict between old world magic, the curse on the House of Maul, being in conflict with modern scientific work. The main character who is able to save the family is a photographer, then a rather modern art where the people involved mixed their own chemicals, did their own procedures, printed their own work. The girl he falls in love with is named Phoebe, a goddess of the sun. So Hawthorne's novels, although not usually seen as fantastic, indeed rely on the fantastic and show a strong interest in science. He even wrote a utopian novel, Brook Farm, based on his own experience at that real utopian community. His most famous short stories are often, in fact, very much science fiction. The birthmark tells the story of a scientist whose love of science and of his wife conflict fantastically. Aylmer loves Georgiana. She is perfect in her beauty, save that she has on her cheek a tiny birthmark in the shape of a hand, which he calls this fairy mark manual. He decides that he will create an elixir that will remove this birthmark from her face. She does not feel the need to have it removed, but loves him so that she submits to his experiments. He continues and continues and continues. His servant, Aminadab, 
whom he, Elmer, refers to as thou man of clay, says, if I had such a wife, I would not want to change her. But Elmer says that there is more good than evil in the knowledge that he seeks, and he seeks to perfect nature. He creates an elixir, which she takes. Her face is unblemished, and she is dead. In Rappuccini's Daughter, the main character, Beatrice, or Beatrice, is the offspring of the man, Rappuccini, who has created his own garden world. In this garden world, the main plant is one with luscious purple blossoms, which Beatrice thinks of as her vegetable sister. The exudates from this plant are so poisonous that insects flying by fall to the ground dead. What Rappuccini has done is created an anti-Eden in which instead of life we find death for anyone from outside the garden, but for those inside the garden, like Beatrice, we have beauty and youth. This is, in a sense, an inversion of the story of Rapunzel. Instead of having someone look into the garden and say, I must have that rampion, Giovanni Guasconte, a student, moves into the neighborhood and has a room that looks down into the garden. He sees Beatrice and he falls in love with her. He must have her, but remember, she is a sister of the plant. Ultimately, she falls in love with him, and he understands that her breath will kill. In order to be able to kiss her, he needs to change her, and he brings her an elixir in a beautiful silver vial. The vial is beautiful, but the contents for her are mortal. She knows this, but nonetheless says, you do not know what you ask of me, but I will do it. She drinks the elixir, and she dies. That story begins with a description of Giovanni coming to this town, to Padua. And in the very first paragraph, we're told that this young stranger was not unstudied in the great poem of his country, recollected, who was not unstudied, and recollected that one of the ancestors of this family, and perhaps an occupant of this very mansion, from which he looks down upon a modern Beatrice walking in the garden, had been pictured by Dante as a partaker of the immortal agonies of his inferno. Now, of course, the heroine of Dante's divine comedy is Beatrice, the one who is able to take the character Dante and walk him through Paradiso. But here on earth, we have a family member from the Inferno. Not only is Italian epic literature an epic literature concerned with holy redemption, crucial here, but also on the very next page, we get a description of the garden that tells us that within it, there is a statue of Vertumnus. Vertumnus is the god of change. He is the god from whom we get the word autumn. Vertumnus is in love with a girl. She, however, will not have anything of men. He comes to her as a beautiful young man. She rejects him. He comes to her as a weak old man. She rejects him. She, he comes to her in the form of a withered old crone and she at least is willing to talk. The old crone talks about the virtues of love. She talks about the beauty of the human form. Eventually, the girl begins to feel that maybe there is the possibility of love in the world. Then Vertumnus changes into a handsome young man, and they consummate their relationship. Vertumnus is the image of change from myth. Change runs all through Rappuccini's daughter. Rappuccinere means to make small, and what Rappuccini has done has been to belittle his daughter and the vegetable natural world by trying, he thinks, to give it the ability to defend itself. What he's really done is imposed upon it his own will, created an anti-Eden that kills.
The title character of Hawthorne's Dr. Heidegger's experiment tries to put his elixir into the hands of his old friends. It turns out that these old friends have long lived past the age of their own erotic energies. He shows them that this elixir can bring back youth. He takes a withered flower that has been pressed in the pages of a book and puts it into the elixir. And before their eyes, they see the flower return to bloom. They immediately agree to drink the elixir, and they become young again, randy, so amorous after their years of senescence that they begin chasing each other around, a number of men and one woman. As they are making young fools of themselves, we see the flower wither again and its petals fall to the floor. The old people soon thereafter return to old age. Dr. Heidegger's experiment was not an experiment in making youth. He knew his elixir would not return youth. It would only return the promise of youth. And these old people are now forever blighted by their desire to find the source of that elixir themselves, which they hear is in Florida, where Ponte de Leon had found the fountain of youth, and they must spend their lives in a fruitless search. Why did Heidegger do this? We're given a hint. He had failed to accept love early in his life, and by the time he was willing to accept it, the woman was no longer available. And he lived a life of bitterness, which finally he revenges by bringing bitterness to people who are supposedly his friends. There are common elements among all of these stories by Hawthorne, and I call the common features that get associated here the Eden complex. It's a phenomenological complex. What is a phenomenological complex? It is not a psychological complex like Freud's Oedipus complex that dominates a single character. Rather, it is a phenomenon as defined by Edmund Husserl as an intentional act of consciousness. That is, all of the pieces of this, whatever it is, coexist together because we take them that way in our minds. Gaston Bachelard, a great French phenomenologist, exemplified phenomenological methods in his book called The Poetics of Space, in which he shows us how in literature and culture, in mythology, in architecture, in fact, in art, we have certain ideas of space, of nests as protective, of attics as intellectual, of basements as having to do with raw passion, and so on. He takes that methodology and uses it to study fire in a famous book called The Psychoanalysis of Fire, in which he defines four different complexes. The one that he uses that's most relevant to us studying science fiction is the Prometheus complex. In the Prometheus complex, we have simultaneously the bringing of enlightenment and fire and the overwhelming action of light that blinds us and fire that consumes us. Prometheus, in other words, stands for fire that complexes, that brings together two opposing sets of ideas. The Eden complex has six constituent elements. Garden imagery, fairy tale aesthetics, natural limits, a godlike scientist, an Oedipal dramatic structure, and a symbol system depending upon dichotomies. Let's go through these one at a time. You'll see, I think, that they all apply to all of these works by Hawthorne. First of all, we have garden imagery, or Eden imagery more specifically. I think of the garden imagery here not simply as the fall, but rather the significance of plant life, plant as inherently life-giving. And yet, at the center of the garden, we have the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is both strengthening for those who will eat of it, they ate of it, and God saw that they were like us. They were like gods when they ate the apple, but also killing us because that fall from eating the apple, from that disobedience, 
cast us out of the garden into a world of childbirth, labor, and death. The Eden imagery we see there includes not only the vegetable, but also the apple as the fruit that gives knowledge and is of knowledge. The snake, which is so clearly phallic and represents the other kind of knowledge, he knew her in the biblical sense. And sight imagery, Eve looks at the apple and saw that it was good to eat. I don't know about you folks, but <laughs> I can't tell that something is good to eat just by looking at it. Otherwise, those displays outside restaurants made out of plastic would long ago have been consumed. Garden imagery, then, is crucial in science fiction. A garden, you must remember, is the space of tamed nature. A garden is not the natural world, but it is also not the built, domesticated building world. It is tamed nature. Fairy tale aesthetics apply in science fiction. The Eden complex tells us that we should see things in strong, simple colors. We have often arbitrary ground rules, and we have the indulgence of the illusion of central position. Because Heidegger is feeling bitter about his youth, he is able to make an elixir that will make other people's lives bitter as well. He is in the center of his world, as is Rappuccini in the center of his, and so on. There are natural limits, expressible perhaps in the phrase, there are some things man was not meant to know. These characters come to bad ends because they fool with science beyond appropriate restraint. They do so in the Eden complex typically because there is a scientist who or some other intellectual striver who either seeks to be God or is God-like. I will control the garden. I will make the elixir that corrects nature's birthmark on my wife's cheek and so on. The dramatic structures within the Eden complex are fundamentally Oedipal. Not Oedipal in the sense of Freud's Oedipus, but Oedipal in the sense of Sophocles, which we discussed earlier. That is, we have a father and a potentially disobedient son. We have competition for the passage of power, which means knowledge, from one generation to the next. If we have an illegitimate conflict between the two generations, then we wind up necessarily with an Oedipal tragedy, as in the conflict between God and Faust in Marlowe's The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus. But if we have a legitimate passage of power, as in The Tempest, where Miranda sees Ferdinand and her father Prospero says, well, I'll give him these tasks to do little tasks. Move this forest over. He performs the tasks and is given Miranda in marriage. Now we have legitimate passage of power from one generation to the next. That licit playing out of the Oedipal dramatic structure leads to a, an Oedipal comedy or romance as opposed to an Oedipal tragedy. One way or the other, the Oedipal structure is concerned with the passage of knowledge, a special form of power, from one generation to the next. To make this work its way out, in science fictions we typically have, or I should say in the Eden complex, we typically have clear dichotomies symbolically. Nature versus science. The animate versus the mechanical. The spiritual versus the mechanical. Spirit versus flesh, mind versus body, slave versus master, female versus male, heart versus head. But what makes this simple set of dichotomies aesthetically quite supple is that we can use them in many different combinations. We can have, for example, the female be the body and the male be the emotions. We can have the spirit be the male and the female be the machine or switch them around. And by switching these back and forth into different combinations, we can work our way through many, many, many different issues. So taken together, we have garden imagery, fairy tale aesthetics, natural limits, a scientist striving to be godlike, a dramatic Oedipal structure, and a symbol system dependent upon clear-cut dichotomies. A phenomenological complex, Bachelard tells us, is such that when we have any piece of it present, all the parts of it are potentially present. When we see Prometheus steal fire from the gods, 
already the destruction of humanity and of Prometheus is implicit in that act of giving. When we see water, which stands for fertility, in huge, huge array, we see the possibility of the dissolution of the self and drowning. In Frankenstein, when we see the monster confront his creator on the glacier at Chamonix, that glacier's whiteness represents the whiteness of a page on which his story may be written, but it also represents water. Water in its frozen state. Water is fertility, but if all that water were to, were to melt, it would not create life. It would drown them both, which is what happens at the end of Frankenstein as the monster goes off alone to make his funeral pyre, light himself with knowledge again, and melt himself away from human conduct, contact. In other words, every part of a phenomenological complex exists even if explicitly we see only one part. The Eden complex is the fundamental complex of science fiction. And so we can see this working its way out in the stories of Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe, unlike Hawthorne, wrote with a style we can call the rhetoric of science. Hawthorne wrote, as you heard, quite romantic sounding language. But Poe writes differently. This is the second, I'm beginning with the second paragraph of the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts. As far as I comprehend them myself, they are succinctly these. And I'll continue with the facts in just a moment. Here is the point of the rhetoric of science. In 1662, the Royal Society was formed in London. The Royal Society with no other name, not the Royal Society of Art or of Drama or what have you. The first Royal Society was the Royal Society that we now know of as the Royal Society of Science, but still called the Royal Society. And they understood that anything that they were to discover that did not accord with the teachings of the Church ran the risk of conflict of authority. Ultimately, in fact, the greatest conflict of authority arose when Newton gave the universal law of gravitation and demonstrated that the movements of the planets in the heavens was governed by the same rules that, govern, that controlled the falling of an apple. Isn't it interesting that we tell the story of it being an apple on the earth? That the rules down below in this fallen world are the same as those above in heaven suggested that these are not two separate realms, that either heaven is secular and fallen, or somehow, and this is clearly false, we're divine. In order to, uh, he, Newton, ultimately became president of the Royal Society. In order to avoid these conflicts, we know from Bishop Spratt's history of the Royal Society, published only five years after the Royal Society was founded, that the fellows set out to create a rhetoric that would evade responsibility that would get them in trouble with the church. So here's what they decided. First, facts need to be reported objectively rather than subjectively. You never say, I never felt so hot. You say, it was so hot that a chicken egg cracked on a, a paving stone was able to solidify within a moment. Second, verbs are typically passive rather than active. You say, you do not say, I poured the water into the concentrated sulfuric acid, which bubbled over and blasted me in the face and I ran running out of the laboratory. You say, the water was poured into the beaker of sulfuric acid and the investigator fled the laboratory. The point is, you don't want yourself to be the observer. All reasonable people should be able to observe that which is reported by science. In addition, key terms should be Latin or Latinate rather than English or Germanic. We talk about Luna, not the moon. We talk about uh, enumeration rather than counting. We look for the kinds of language that would be the language that scholars used back before the Renaissance, when in fact everyone communicated in the common language, or learned people, in the common language of Latin.
Wherever possible, numbers are used. You don't say, oh, I felt so hot. You say I had a temperature of, and you give a certain number of degrees. So the rhetoric of science says facts are to be reported objectively. Verbs are preferentially in the passive form. Key terms should be Latin. And wherever possible, we use numbers. Now getting back to the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts as far as I comprehend them myself. In those I'm not saying I have special knowledge. They are succinctly these. Notice it is rendered necessary, not I decided to do it. And these are facts. My attention for the last three years has been repeatedly drawn to, not I decided to do this, but I was pulled in, the subject of mesmerism, a nice scientific kind of word. And about nine months ago, it occurred to me quite suddenly that in this series of experiments made hitherto, blah, 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 about nine months ago, Poe is playing a game here with us. That's a fairly pregnant amount of time to have, even if we're going to enumerate. And it occurs to this fellow quite suddenly, he does not think it up. Everything is, is passive. Every, all responsibility is pushed outside. The series of experiments had a remarkable and unaccountable omission. No person had yet been mesmerized in articulo mortis which is simply Latin for at the point of death. Why not write at the point of death? Because this writer is using the rhetoric of science. He does not want to complain. He does not want to thwart authority. And so he does, in fact, mesmerize someone in articulo mortis. That person remains dead, as far as we can tell. Um, in fact, he holds a mirror in front of his face, his black tongue <laughs> is sticking out. He has no breath on the mirror. But when he talks to the man, the tongue itself begins to vibrate, we're told. No breath, but the tongue itself vibrates and sends, somehow sends out the words, I am dead, quick, quick, let me die. At the end of the story, the, the investigator makes a series of mesmeric, mesmeric passes. Earlier, he had put the patient into, into uh, this state by making, as he said, a series of passes by staring him in the right eye and exchanging vertical ones for horizontal ones. If you make that motion yourself, you'll see that this is an ironic play against the extreme unction, last rites. When he goes to release the man, he says, as I rapidly made mesmeric passes amid ejaculations, think what you like of that word, of dead, dead, absolutely bursting from the tongue and not from the lips of the sufferer, his whole frame at once, within the space of a single minute or even less, shrunk, crumbled, absolutely rotted away beneath my hands. Upon the bed, before that whole company, there lay a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putridity. There are some things man was not meant to know, and what seems explicitly that man was not meant to know is how to keep death from coming. But in fact, this is a coming. This is a an ironic version of masturbation, just as we had gotten an ironic version of extreme unction. What Poe is giving us is people who cannot stand to deal with ordinary sexuality. If we look at Poe's stories, like The Descent into the Maelstrom, where someone is changed utterly by falling into that terrible pit, or The Pit and the Pendulum, in which somebody is in the grips of the Inquisition and notices the number of paces around it takes to get the dimensions of the pit, calculates the acceleration of the pendulum about to cut him off. We have the language, the rhetoric of science in all of these. We have the entire Eden complex, save for one factor. We do not have a female figure. But if we believe that a phenomenological complex has all of its parts implicitly there once we notice that it's in play. We can see that the maelstrom itself in its vaginal form is the female figure.
that the pit itself in its vaginal form is the female figure, and that the four-poster bed in which the man waiting to be released into death lies is the female figure, and at the end, they all dissolve. In other words, Poe writes stories in the heart of the Eden complex, but he cannot bring himself to engage a woman explicitly. It is that love of woman which causes the scientist to fear, ultimately to die. What can we infer from these analyses of the, com the Eden complex? First of all, America which has a long tradition of seeing itself as the Eden compared to the old world, a place in which one can be reformed and make oneself anew, is culturally suited for science fiction. Second, we can hypothesize that much science fiction employs the Eden complex, and further study will show that these two authors are by no means unusual. And finally, we can say that if the, we can spot the elements of the Eden complex, once we do, understanding that complex, is, we have a quick route into the deep understanding of the mythic power of any given science fiction story.